This is Winchester Academy. bygone centuries, always meant the best living writer or poet of the time. And in Wisconsin, in 2017-18, um, we are pleased to have with us Wisconsin's uh, uh, present poet laureate, Carla Houston. She's the author of many books, chapbooks, at least eight, recipient of numerous literary awards and recognitions. She resides in Appleton. She is active in several Fox City's writing projects. She is a graduate with a bachelor's and master's in English and creative writing from UW Oshkosh. So please, yeah, I see Dick and other uh, alums here are glad to hear that. Uh, actually, that's one of my uh, schools as well. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Wisconsin Poet, Poet Laureate, Carla Houston. How's that? Okay, so how many of you are retired high school English teachers? <laughs> Yay for us. <laughs> Actually, it's so nice to see one of my former colleagues from Nina High School, Judy Schwanick, and one of my childhood friends from um, way back at West Salem Elementary School. So Linda Casera, it's good to see everybody here tonight. Um, I will, st I, I cannot, um, start my presentation without um, just making a little pitch for the Poet Laureate program in the state of Wisconsin. This is not a taxpayer funded position. This is a position that's funded by people like you. Um, there are various arts boards and citizens at large who help cho choose the Poet Laureate and so Poet Laureate travels around the state as much as he or she can um, and with you know funding from places like this um, so we, I have some envelopes at the back of the room and also some up here and it would be lovely if you could tuck a few dollars or even more than that <laughs> in the envelope and send it off. So I'd be remiss without mentioning it. So I'm so glad to see everybody here tonight. I am ashamed to say I've lived in Appleton for almost 31 years and I've never actually been in Wapaka. I've sort of driven by Wapaka on the way to somewhere else, which is really a terrible thing <laughs> to admit to, but it's wonderful. And I understand from dinner tonight that some people in Wapaka have never been to Appleton, so <laughs> fair is fair. <laughs> fair is fair. So um, I, I have a presentation on why poetry matters, and um, it matters a great deal to me. But I'm one of these people who doesn't like to stand up here and read a speech. So if you feel the you know, need to raise your hand and ask a question, please do so at any time. And um, so I'll begin. So you'll have to forgive me for this. So what's all this fuss about poultry? Those chickens have enough problems nitpicking at the bugs in the lawn. We need more poultry, not less. Those brown speckled eggs, those pretty setting hens. How about a round of applause for? What? Oh, poetry. Never mind. <laughs> so if you recognize my poor attempt at Miss Emily Latella, who is constantly delusional on the early Saturday Night Live programs. Um, at one time, um, poetry was considered an essential part of our lives. Back at the turn of the uh, 20th century, um, very often poetry could be found in magazines and in newspapers, and you could go to poetry readings, and you could go to lectures and essay and hear essays and hear poets talk. Um, sometime um, around the turn of the um, 20th century, um, the birth of the critic happened, and um, so. Um, 
people started writing for the accolades of the critics. And there were, and still are, some poets who think that you have to be a certain kind of smart to understand their work. And if you don't get it, then you're not smart enough. I don't subscribe to that. Back in the day, people um, memorized poems. Did any of you memorize poems when you were in school? Yeah. Can any of you remember any of those poems? <laughs> Yeah, you can. OK, anyone want to say a few, a few lines? <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> OK. Um, anyway, so interestingly enough, um, my grandfather was the class poet of the graduating class of maybe 1911 from Bangor High School. I think there were six in his class, and he wrote a poem about each, uh, wrote a verse about each one of them as a parody to that wonderful Longfellow poem, uh, The Song of Hiawatha. So each one had its, his own little verse, you know, by the shores of Gitche by the shining big sea water. And you know where Gitche is, right? Lake Superior, right? So I thought that was pretty cool. So anyway, so about the 19th or early 20th century, some poets decided that um, they were going to try to please the critics, and poetry became very difficult. You think about reading T.S. Eliot maybe when you were in college, Ezra Pound, some of those poets. They, you know, they were purposefully difficult. And there are some poets who are writing that way now. Um, but luckily for us is there are many kinds of poetry. It's like a buffet table of poets out there. You can pick and choose the ones that you like and the ones that actually resonate with you. Um, I remember when I was in high school, you know, I don't really remember um, getting a poetry education when I was in high school, but maybe somebody in my class might remember. I had the same old battle axe English teacher for four years, and I loved her. <laughs> and and um, she's the reason I became an English teacher. But um, I always felt that, you know, there was something holy about reading poetry like reading Shakespeare. And I actually got Shakespeare, strange as it may seem. But um, it was hard and something for only smart people. And I was not one of those people who um, could understand it. And, um, you know, I'm thinking back to my, some of my college classes at UW Oshkosh when I went back. I was in my 40s when I get, went back to school. And, um, you know, some of the classes that I had to take where the professor just spewed at us what this poem was about. And there was never any time to read it and think about it. And so I just agreed with them and spewed it right back at them and all of my A papers. Because, you know, once you get that first A, you know, you have this kind of golden halo over you, and then you can do anything you want for the rest of the semester. <laughs> anyway, um, what, was, what was, are some of your experiences with poetry in school? Anybody? What was rhyming? Rhyming? Yeah. Well, rhyming was a very big part of the classic poets that probably most of us studied when we were in school. Yes? I had a teacher when I was a sophomore in high school, and we read the Emily Dickinson poem about the, the, the day, and it was the bobolinks begun, and she, Emily Dickinson used begun instead of began. And the teacher was very condescending and said, well, she wrote so many sweet poems, it's OK if she misused a word. But in fact, Emily <laughs> Dickinson, if you read a lot of her, always uses begun. She never uses begin. It's like part of her internal yeah. grammar yeah. that the bobblings were in the state of having yeah. been begun. It's, it's kind of part of her artsiness. Yeah. But anyway, I just always remember how easy it was for that. And she was a substitute, besides, for Mrs. Shunkin to say, uh, well, she was such a sweet lady and wrote nice poems. It's OK if she misused a word. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I did a presentation at the uh, Performing Arts Center in Appleton about Walt Whitman. And Walt Whitman was probably not the first, but probably is credited as being the first poet to write in free verse where he didn't use rhyme. And um, there were other poets who were testing those waters. But, you know, uh, Walt Whitman and Dickinson lived about the same time, where Emily Dickinson was very reclusive. I think she only published four or five, maybe six poems in her lifetime. And Walt Whitman self-published Leaves of Grass and all subsequent versions of it. And he even paid people to review it <laughs> positively. So, <laughs> of course. 
But anyway, you know, I, I don't remember poetry in, in elementary school and high school, but I do remember it in college. And um, when I was thinking about, I was in college in the late 60s at UW La Crosse, and I was lying on the lawn between Main Hall and the Student Union reading Rod McEwen. Anybody remember him? Oh, yeah. And I understood those poems, and mostly they were poems of love and loss, and my boyfriend had left for the Navy, not before dumping me for someone else. <clears throat> I would like to add that we've been married for 49 years. <laughs> He's been roaming around here, but, um, you know, and really, actually, um, you know, Rod McEwen does not have much of a reputation by, you know, people who are in the poetry biz. A little bit of Rod. It's nice sometimes to open up a heart and let a little, open up the heart a little and let some hurt come in. It proves you're still alive. I mean, when you're 18, you're just going, oh, my God, he knows what it's like. <laughs> but he kind of, you know, his popularity sort of ebbed and flowed over his lifetime. And uh, most serious poets don't have much good to say about his work. But, you know, whatever gets you to poetry is what gets you to poetry. So make no apologies, um, you know, for that. I think the, probably the first poem that I ever heard in my house, and we were not a big literary family, but um, the uh, Gillette Burgess poem, I never saw a purple cow. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you anyhow. I'd rather see than be one. And I thought my dad made that up, but <laughs> he might have led me to believe that. <laughs> so um, it's very hard to define poetry. So, you know, what it is, it's like trying to define love, you know, or hate. I mean, everybody has an opinion about what it is. And I think it's probably more important to define what it does rather than what it is. Um, and so, you know, here's a couple of quotes from, this one is from Octavio Paz. I think the mission of poetry is to create among people the possibility of wonder, admiration, enthusiasm, mystery, the sense that life is marvelous. When you say life is marvelous, you are saying a banality, but to make life a marvel, that is the role of poetry. So poetry is, you know, we'll show you how marvelous life can be, but just to say it's marvelous is really, marvelous is a has a different meaning to every person. Um, William Carlos Williams, this is one of my favorite quotes. It's difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. And William Carlos Williams was a early uh, 20th century poet. He was a physician, and he wrote, um, uh, his poems on the back of prescription pads. And so this one was an apology to his wife for being unfaithful. The uh, poem is called Asphodel, That Greeny Flower. But this quote comes at the very end. It's difficult to get the news from poems, yet men and women die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Still gives me goosebumps. And James Auden, poetry is a clear expression of mixed feelings. And Robert Frost, I love this. Like a piece of ice on a hot stove, the poem must ride on its own melting. Oh. Like a piece of ice on a hot stove, a poem must ride on its own melting. Hold on. I've had this cold for going on six weeks, so I really hope I don't start coughing. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> Don't worry, I've been twice. I've been told you have a cold. <laughs> Thank you. Better to define poetry um, by what it does rather than what it is. So I'm asking, is this your experience with poetry? Um, an English teacher trying to get you to torture a confession out of it. In defense of English teachers, perhaps she was just trying to you know, get you to give it a chance. But I think, and I was an English teacher, but I think English teachers come with a set of textbooks, and this stuff is in the book, and it's on the curriculum. And sometimes, more often than not, they're, than not, they're not poets. And so they immediately read the poem to the kids and then say, well, what does it mean? 
And, um, you know, I think that's so hard because, you know, it might mean something, one thing to you and something different to you. Um, better to like it and then worry about what it means later. But here's a poem by a former U.S. Poet Laureate, Billy Collins, called Introduction to Poetry. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide or press an ear against its hive. I say drop a mouse into the poem and watch him probe his way out or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin by beating it with a hose to find out what, what it really means. <laughs> and I think that's so true. But you know, in defense of English teachers everywhere, you know, we don't always get a choice of what's in our textbooks. We just get them. Um, so you know, you know, at the risk of torturing a confession out of Billy Collins' poem, what do you think he's talking about? Do I have to read it again? <laughs> yes. I think he's, uh, we have to be sympathetic to the teacher. Yeah. He's sitting all these students trying to come up with something about this poem means, and they're just torturing him. Yeah. yeah. So I think he's saying, you know how hard it is to teach poetry. Yeah. Well, and he did teach poetry for many, many years. And that's what he did. He wrote his own poetry on the side. But he, you know, have fun with the poem. Yes. But don't just eat up the poem by trying to get yeah. meaning out of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, water ski, let the poem water ski across the lake and wave at the author from the shore. I mean, that's, it's a fun image. It's, you know, you're having a good time. You should enjoy it. And then, you know, worry about what it means later, maybe. And maybe it doesn't mean anything to you. Maybe it has lovely descriptions and images, and maybe it has lovely uses of words, and maybe it doesn't mean anything at all. Maybe it's just for fun. Um, so today's poetry is pure art for art's sake, um, written for the pleasure of writing it. It's not feelings and emotions on the page, though that can be part of it. It's not therapy, although writing poetry can be very therapeutic. In today's poems, ideas, thoughts, and in feelings are expressed by the thing. Contemporary poetry, and by that I mean poetry written in the 20th and the 21st century, reflects the idea of the personal, the resonance of the experience. William Carlos Williams says, no ideas but in things. <coughs> so, you know, if you're all confused, here's Emily Dickinson, hope is the thing with feathers. Try to define hope. But she shows you that it's a bird. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. So that's just an excerpt of it. But that's, that's what I mean by showing you the thing and then you find out that make the connection between hope and the bird and the feather. Um, I have a poem that I have written. I'm going to share a few of my poems tonight. This one, I think some of you, this may resonate with some of you. Um, if you're, especially if you're my age. Um, my mother cutting my bangs. Linda, you'll probably laugh. She steadied her hand as I sat before her, perched on the edge of the kitchen counter. My head had been crammed under a faucet, a rag held over my eyes to keep the soap out while she sudsed, shampooed, and rinsed with the aluminum tumbler nearby. I was rubbed and toweled, my bangs flattened, scotch taped against my brow. She came at me with scissors sharp as my grandmother's tongue while she snipped, snipped, swore, uh, but my bangs wouldn't comply and stay even. They shrunk from the shears, backing away, getting shorter, but no less straight. She stepped back, sighed, her work done for that day at least. My bangs, crooked and unruly, became an abstract painting against the pale canvas of my forehead, a glimmer of the scissor-wielding woman I, too, would one day become. <laughs> and if you remember those 50s pictures, you know, the perfectly straight bangs, but mine were usually about this short, because, you know, it was all that going back and trimming and cutting. 
So, you know, the idea of this poem, of course, is that you know, women are going to, you know, do women things and, you know, they're going to cut their daughter's hair or their son's hair. But, um, you know, I'm hoping that some of the language in there and some of the imagery might make you think back to your childhood or maybe your mother doing the same thing or your dad. Maybe he was the guy who came at you with the clippers. But, you know, you think about the way the styles were back in those days. It was very much that style. And if you look at my hair, it's kind of curly. So no wonder my bangs wouldn't stay straight. And which, of course, brings up the Saturday night home perm, but we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> this poem actually is, you could probably call it a lyric, because it, because it covers a moment in time, but it also has a narrative element to it as a beginning, a middle, and an end. So it's a poem that also tells a story. So, what else do you notice about my poem? There should be one thing. This is a, t this is a test. It doesn't rhyme, right? It doesn't rhyme. And um, most poets writing um, now do not rhyme their poems. There are many poets who, do, who still do. They're called the new formalists, and they're experimenting with some of the traditional forms from the past. Um, but rhyming has become kind of passe unless you're very, very good at it. And I mean coming up with rhymes that are better than moon, june, and spoon, or tears falling like rain on the plain. So it is, you know, there, I heard somebody say once, there's nothing free about free verse, because there's a lot of work that goes into it, and you, on, you know, on the first time you hear this or the first time you read it, you're probably unlikely to notice what's going on, what's going on inside of the line. And those strong images and those um, words that echo off of each other and the rhythms of the words. And I'm one of these people, when I read a book of poems, I'm constantly doing this. And my husband always says, what are you doing? I said, I'm counting syllables. I'm trying to find out how many syllables are in a line. So there's a lot of that that goes on that's not rhyme. And um, it's not necessarily easier or harder to rhyme a poem than it is to do um, free verse. So I'm hoping that you notice some strong imagery that you could see my mother you know, going after me with those scissors and the bangs taped down. Um, contemporary poetry is very strong in imagery. So you should see pictures popping into your head. The famous poet Ezra Pound, for example, this is one of his most famous lines. Um, in the station at the Metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bough. The apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet back, wet black bough. So, you know, he's looking at people and seeing something more than just people. He's moved into that area where he has taken some poetic license and is imagining that these could be, you know, flower petals or cherry blossoms on a bough. So one of his most famous lines. Um, here's another poem with a very strong image in it, and you probably have heard this one, so jump in if you want to say it with me. This is William Carlos Williams. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So what is about what it is about? I don't know. But we have this image of this red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater and these white chickens. Now, you can't see the poem from where you're sitting, but it's very short and two line stanzas, and he has you know, so much depends. Four syllables in the first line, and the next line, upon. What he has done is called enjambment. So he says, so much depends, and as a reader you're saying, depends upon what? And you're forced into the next line. And so upon a red wheel, and then barrow is on the next line. So he pushes you as a reader into that next line by the way he's made his line breaks. Uh, glazed with rain, and then water on the next line. So you've got a four syllables and then two. And then beside the white and then chickens on the last line. So 
it's kind of fun to try to figure out. I still don't know what it means. But it's a wonderful image, and it's a really wonderful exercise as a writer to see how much you can pack into very few words. You know, to see how many, I mean, if you're writing poetry, try sometime to take out all your adjectives and adverbs, because it's really hard. <laughs> but it's a really good exercise. I took a class from a poet from Ripon, Tom Montag, and he had us write a 36-word poem. That's not very many words. So we shared it around the room, and then he said, now take out half of them. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so you're starting to make some pretty serious choices to try to hang on to what you meant by cutting out half of the words. <coughs> so that's what poets do, is they pay so close attention to words, and they're constantly thinking about ways to compress them. I had a middle school kid um, in Mineral Point ask me last year what was the difference between poetry and prose. And I said, well, Angel food cake. You have you know, this beautiful angel food cake sitting on the table your mom just made or you just made, and that's prose. So you take that angel food cake and smoosh it down, and I know you've wanted to do this all your life. Just take it and just pound it down into a ball. That's poetry. That's that little ball of sweetness that you end up from with this great big airy cake. So. He seemed to buy it, but I don't know. <laughs> I, was, I, had, I read a poem there. I had to explain what a 45 record was. <laughs> Another reason to, for poetry is that it, it slows you down as a reader. You are asked to attend to poetry in a different way, savoring each word slowly, stopping to pay attention. Give each poem that you tackle to read at least two times through. Uh, I remember, uh, I just recently reviewed a book for a library journal of a book of poems, and I thought it was so obtuse and I didn't like it, but you know, that's my job, so I had to read the book again, and the second time through, I just kind of went, oh, wow, this is really, really terrific. But it takes a while sometimes to figure out what's going on in a poem, and I promise you, it's worth it. Um, Naomi Shihab Nye, who's a poet from San Antonio, and many of may, you may know her work, she said at the Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival in an interview with Bill Moyers, she said, poetry is a slow kind of talk. And she adds, my favorite quote, which comes from Thailand, she says, life is so short, we must move very slowly. Life is so short, we must move very slowly. And she said, now think about a haiku. How many people have savored a haiku poem over a period of hundreds of years? It slows you down to read a poem. You read it more than one time. You read it more slowly than you would speak to somebody in a store. And we need that kind of slow experience in our words and in our lives. You know, our lives are fast paced. We need to have that opportunity to sit down and, and savor some words and just wait. So some translations, speaking of haiku, and we were speaking about this at dinner. Um, haiku, when it's translated from the Japanese, often ends up with that very um, cliched five, seven, five syllable, three line poem. But really, the Japanese didn't write it that way. So um, Robert Hass is a poet who has translated a lot of Japanese poets. So here are three of his translations from Isa. The snow is melting and the village is flooded with children. The snow is melting, and the village is flooded with children. Don't worry, spiders. I keep house casually. <laughs> Don't worry, spiders. I keep house casually. And then finally, even with insects, some can sing, some can't. Even with insects, some can sing and some can't. So um, reading and writing poetry and reading any kind of literature, as you retired high school English teachers know, we read literature because it creates empathy. You know, it's, it's a vicarious experience. It's fun. You get to go, um, you know, travel the world and in time and space. 
But it also, when we connect with a good piece of literature, we connect because it rings true with us. And I remember talking to my high school students, just blabbing away about Hamlet and saying, imagine, you know, you're just your first year of college and you get a note that comes weeks later that said, your father has died, come home. And so, you know, he's just barely 18 years old. So he goes home, finds out his father has died and his mother has remarried in the interim already. And, you know, what do you think about that? You know, and then he goes up to contemplate his sorry lot in life and the ghost of his father shows up and says, I've been murdered, you must take revenge. You know, that's a story, you know, a play that's over 400 years old. But that idea of it, you know, that betrayal, love, and loss are things that we can relate to even now. I mean, that's what good literature is made of. So um, good poetry also has resonance. And I've talked about that word, that echoing, that ringing true with you. It reverberates through time and space, like Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, or Frost's Stopping By the Woods on a Snowy Evening, or his Nothing Gold, Nothing Gold Can Stay, or The Road Not Taken. I mean, all of us can probably re recite a line or two of Robert Frost. Um, they mean something to us because they hit us where we live. We've had those experiences. <coughs> All of these famous poems touch us where we live because we are human. We live, we love, and we lose. We grieve and we celebrate. We try to live our uh, lives with a small amount of joy. And poetry can sometimes give us that. Which poems were important to you or are important to you that you read all the time or you turn back to or you committed to memory. Yes? W.S. Merwin. W.S. Merwin. Any particular poem? No, but he writes so beautifully of graceful aging. Yes. And both uh, Provence and Hawaii come into his poems quite beautifully also. Yes, yes. I have a poem that I often used in my classes called The Unwritten. And you hold up a pencil and say, that inside this pencil are words that have never been written, never have been spoken, never have been heard. They're you know, trying to come out light, after, light out in the dark. And you know, it ends up with every pencil in the world is like this. All we have to do is just have the opportunity to pick it up and use it. So yes, other, I saw other hands. Yes? My great aunt, Helen Basement. Say that again. My great aunt, Helen Baseman. Your great aunt, Helen Baseman. She was a poet. Wonderful. Is a poet. Very, very descriptive. Yes. Wonderful. Good. Good. Anyone else? Yes. Shel Silverstein. Shel Silverstein. Absolutely. Who didn't? Who here didn't read those poems to your kids when they were little, <laughs> and read them yourself when you were little? Yeah. And there was another hand. Yes. Mary Oliver, yes, I've got a Mary Oliver poem to share with you tonight, so yes. But there are poems by these people. Mary Oliver doesn't rhyme, by the way, in just case I'm getting that no rhyming daggers being thrown at me. <laughs> anyway, here's just an excerpt of a really wonderful Naomi Shihab Nye called, a poem called Kindness. And I encourage you to go look it up online. And this is just a small stanza. Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken were st will stare out the window forever. So there's three more stanzas, but it's one of her most <laughs> famous poems called Kindness. So and I, I'm going to just talk briefly right here um, about poetry and memory. Because one of my projects, or my pet project as a poet laureate, is to work with memory cafes. And I've, been, I've got one in Wednesday, uh, Wednesday in Waukesha. But I bring poetry 
to um, memory cafes are social events. Do you have them in, in Wapaka, memory cafes? Somebody's saying yes, someone's saying no. <laughs> they can be in restaurants or they can be in care facilities and they can be in libraries and there's social gatherings where information is shared and people gather together, um, people who are suffering from mild dementia and their caregivers. So they have a good time, they have you know, resources that they can go to. And my goal is to bring poetry to them. And we often um, do a call and response where we share a poem together. And um, then we'll often write a poem together. We'll create a group poem from everyone contributing. And um, one of the nice things about call and response, where we, I recite a line and they recite it back to me, is that it activates that oral tradition of storytelling and echoes the musical quality of poems, uh, especially those classic poems which rely heavily on meter and rhyme. So often, that's what I bring to share with them. I do share some of my own poems, and they notice right away that you don't, you're not rhyming. So. Um, one of the goals of Memory Cafe is to validate even the smallest contribution. So when we um, do a group poem together, whatever, you know, whatever they can contribute is written down and is used. Um, I was in um, uh, Manitowoc at a care facility there, and I was in a locked dementia ward. So the people who were there had very severe dementia. Um, out of the eight or nine people who were there, three of them were sleeping. Um, and one woman was doing what's called looping. She kept repeating, my brother was here. My brother was here yesterday. And whoever was there, she said, you know, kept saying that over and over and over. And so I was trying to elicit responses about spring using the senses. In other words, what does spring feel like? and trying to elicit responses. So one of the um, caregivers went over to her and took her by the cheeks and um, said, Harriet, what does spring feel like? And just like that, she snapped out of it and said, why, it feels like being kissed by a horse. Oh, best line of the day, but you know, she, she you know, that, that her caregiver going over there and touching her broke that loop. And um, that's something I would not do. I would never touch someone without their permission, especially someone who has that severe of dementia because it would be very upsetting to them because they don't know me. Um, another uh, memory cafe in Clintonville just a couple of weeks ago, a man whose dementia was pretty severe. He was, um, he was uh, still living at home with a, his wife as a caregiver, but he, you know, we were talking about things that we liked to taste at Thanksgiving, and I don't remember his name, but I said, do you like hot chocolate? Mmm, yeah, he, he liked it. And so we went through this whole process and when I was getting ready to leave, he looked after, over at me with a big smile on his face. So I don't know if I did anything for him, but it made me feel good that he was smiling when he saw me, so that maybe he enjoyed it. So here's a little call and response practice for you. So this is a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson called The Eagle. So you've got to flex your arms because you have to put some hand gestures in there. So I'm going to read the poem to you and then we'll do it together. The Eagle by Alfred Lord Tennyson. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with the azure world he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls, he watches from the mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt he falls. So think about what you might you know, do for gestures. All right, I'll say the line, you say the line back to me. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. Close to the sun in lonely lands. Close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. 
He watches from the mountain walls. And like a thunderbolt, he falls. Awesome. Awesome. So that's what we do sometimes. And maybe we'll do a couple of poems like that. Um, we, sometimes we sing. And um, the gang on Wednesday is going to be singing White Christmas with me. So, but back to why poetry. I'm watching my time here, and I'm up to page eight. So, <laughs> why do we turn to poetry when times are difficult? I was just talking to you about that earlier. David Kirby, in his essay, Why Poetry, says, end quote, as Adrian Rich said in her National Book Award speech, when poetry lays its hand on our shoulder, we can be, to an almost physical degree, touched and moved, unquote. And we can be affected in this way and, and, by, and by, at any time by any poem. Here's just a little uh, snippet of Neruda. He was one of those poets that um, was very political, and he was exiled from Chile and spent a lot of time in an island near Italy. Um, so here's his uh, poem, Neruda. And it was at that age poetry arrived in search of me. I don't know. I don't know where it came from, from winter or a river. I don't know how or when. Nor they were not, no, they were not voices. They were not words nor silence. But from a street I was summoned, from the branches of night, abruptly from the others, among violent fires or returning alone. There I was without a face, and it touched me. There I was without a face, and it touched me. Love those last two lines. So we come back to poetry because it's the only art form that can, that can do what it does. Um, you know, it, do, it can do a better job of capturing emotion that matter to us, the ones that we don't fully understand but pierce our hearts like spears. We haul out poems for weddings and funerals and other celebrations. And um, we recite them, you know, and you know, what, what is it about poetry that does that? Maybe it's that little compressed ball of sweetness that doesn't have 10,000 other words around it, but it just goes right to the heart of the matter. Um, over the millennia, the fundamental uh, emotions haven't changed, nor will they. Cave people felt, um, and our successors will feel, the love of beauty, hatred of wrongdoing, fear of death. In any case, there are millions of poems out there, and we are, and most are short. They go by quickly, but when you need one, nothing else will do. So, you know, why poetry? Why not? I say, why not? It's an art, and art gives back. Art lets us know we will be okay. We have, uh, we, uh, we ha sometimes have our houses and our families, our jobs and our careers. Art makes those things mean something. People move to our communities for good jobs and good schools. They stay because we offer something beautiful. We offer this, this gathering of people. You know, it's become important and for more than 25 years. So poetry is therapeutic. It can be deep or profound. It can be silly. It can make you laugh or cry. Or to quote Miss Emily <coughs> Dickinson, it can blow the top of your head off. So I'm going to just talk briefly um, about, you know, if you've never read much poetry, you know, how do you dip your toes into those waters? It can be kind of scary. You know, God forbid you're caught with a book of poetry when you're having your coffee at, at McDonald's. <laughs> but it is hard. But some most worthwhile things are hard. Contemporary poetry, however, is less metaphysical and less abstract and making, it's making it much more reader friendly. It's less involved with ideas and more involved with things and examples in which those ideas are expressed. It's easier to understand. So I suggest to people to start with what's being written now and then work backwards instead of starting with what was written you know, 5,000 years ago and working forward. You know, some of that stuff is very, very difficult and long. And who knows where they got those words. Um, but have you ever read T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland? And you have you know, this much text and then this much footnotes? Oh. Anyway, 
<laughs> anyway, um, contemporary poetry is often based in personal experience, although I will like to add that poets are notorious liars. So other than telling you of my you know, mother cutting my bangs, you, know, you don't know what in my poems are true and what are not true. I remember um, Ellen Court years ago saying that she had read a poem at a reading about a woman's experience with breast cancer and all these people came up afterwards and grabbed her hand and hugged her and said, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know, I didn't know. And she said, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me. So you never know. The thing is, if it's done skillfully enough, it seems like it could be you. But she said it was someone else's experience, but she took it and made something of it. She made art out of it. Um, I would worry, um, I, oh, I'll start with what's new and work backwards. The more poetry you read, the better reader you will become. And um, I'm a much better reader of poetry now than I was, say, 20 years ago. And I'm much more patient with it, because 20 years ago, I wasn't very patient with it. And it's like, I don't get this. I'm turning the page. Um, worry less about what the poem means. You know, I know we want to know what the poem means, but you should enjoy the language. You should enjoy the imagery. You should enjoy the sounds and the metaphors. Worry less about what it means. If you like the poem, then you like the poem. You don't, it doesn't matter what it means. You know, I, there was a book of poems that I had. My first book of poems that I bought in Appleton at a bookstore, a little small book of poems. And there was a poem in there where one of the lines, uh, one of the title was called, Morning Becomes Her, Comma, Henry. And I bought that book in 1996. It took me 20 years to figure out what that was about. She was referring to John Berryman's Henry in his Dream Songs book. But I didn't have enough of a background in poetry to know what that was. So after I read Dream Songs, I, a couple of years later, I picked up that book and went, oh, <laughs> I get it now. But that's kind of fun, too, where you have that aha moment where you weren't expecting it. Um, let your taste guide you. There are poems about writing poems. There are poems about basketball, football, bowling, that shiny new car in your driveway, muffins in the display case at Perkins, poems about bagels rolling down the street, there are poems about war and peace, uh, poems about nature, poems about language. There are poems about love and loss. I have a poem at home pinned on my blackboard, something about, um, suppose there was a badger, Jesus. <laughs> it, was, it was funny and curious, but I mean, there's so many things poems can be about. Um, just let your taste guide you. I always say that I don't, um, I don't really like very, very hard poems. But that doesn't mean they're not worthwhile. I'm not going to say they're not good poems, because somebody's publisher decided to put money behind this book. They're just not my taste. I don't care for escargot. I don't care if you like it, but I personally don't like it. But so you have to look at it that way. There are going to be poems that you aren't going to like, but there are going to be quite a few that you will. Um, so get yourself to the library. Mosey, past the People magazines, the Wall Street Journal, and past New Fiction. Enter the stacks around 808 or 810 or 821. Librarian's going to check me out on that. <laughs> Make sure I have that right. One of those is British poetry. I think it's maybe 821. But, um, and then just you know, park yourself there and start pulling books off the shelf. No one is going to be there with you. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> so you're going to have that place all to yourself. <laughs> but that's what I did. I read an interview with one of my favorite poets, and I, she named her favorite books of poetry. And I went to the library and checked them all out. And you check out as many books as your library will allow you to take out, and then come back and check out some more. Carla, it's free. Pardon? 75. 75? Yeah. OK. Well, anyway, the library is your best friend, <laughs> as I say this in a library, because you don't have to pay for those books. You can don't just don't dog your pages or write in them. Um, but you know, you get all these opportunities to read something for nothing. You don't have to go out and buy a book at all. But if you find something that you like, um, then be sure you look up the author and, and support that author um, by buying a book. There are no rich poets. Um, 
So a book of poems is like a box of chocolates. Find something that touches you. Another way to make poetry part of your daily life is take a blank notebook and handwrite your favorite poems into it. It's better if you can memorize the poem, but I can't hold anything in my head for more than about three seconds. But if you like, you know, Frost the Road Not Taken, write it into your notebook in your own hand. Take his words. They become part of you. You know, you're taking that in through hand and eyes by tr transcribing those words. And keep a notebook of famous poems you like. I was geeky enough in high school that I kept a notebook of famous quotes. But, you know, you can do that with famous quotes and famous poems. Um, and then, better yet, memorize them and then, um, you know, practice reciting them. You can do that on Christmas, and, you know, instead of opening presents, you can recite poems to each other. <laughs> How would that work? Anyway, find some good literary journals. There are many of them that are online now for free for the reading. Um, go to readings, buy books. As I said earlier, there is no thing, such thing as a rich poet. But I'd also like to add, there's no money in poetry, but there is no poetry in money either. That's Robert Graves. <laughs> Finally, breathe in and touch the words and let them become part of you. Um, and William, William Carlos Williams also said, if it ain't a pleasure, it ain't a poem. So I'm going to share a couple of my favorite poems with you, and then I'll read a couple of my own poems, and then we'll have some questions and some answers, maybe. Unless I've covered everything and you just want to go home. <laughs> All right, here's a poem that I'm not entirely sure what it means, but I just like it. Are you fam familiar with James Wright, the poet from Minnesota? This is, then you may know this poem called A Blessing. Just off the highway to Rochester, Minnesota, twilight bounds softly forth on the grass, and the eyes of those two Indian ponies darken with kindness. They have come gladly out of the willows to welcome my friend and me. We step over the barbed wire into the pasture where they have been grazing all day alone. They ripple tensely. They can hardly contain their happiness that we have come. They bow shyly as wet swans. They love each other. There is no loneliness like theirs. At home once more, they begin munching the young tufts of spring in the darkness. I would like to hold the slenderer one in my arms, for she has walked over to me and muzzled my left hand. She is black and white. Her mane falls wild on her forehead, and the light breeze moves me to caress her long ear that is delicate as the skin over a girl's wrist. Suddenly, I realize that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. Just, you know, goosebumps, goosebumps. <laughs> and he has another poem called um, Lying in a Hammock on William Duffy's Farm where the last line is, I have wasted my life. I'm like, oh gosh, oh Lord. All right, I'll read a couple of poems of mine and then we'll see if you have some questions that you want to ask. Um, I have a poem called Lakes in Wisconsin. And my husband is a bass fisherman and he often, you know, goes here, there, or wherever and fishes and he said, oh, there's Long Lake. And I said, will you fish there? But yeah, I would know it was the other Long Lake. I said, wait a minute there are two long lakes in the same county or whatever. So I did some research and you really can find this stuff online. Lakes have been pressed in lakes in Wisconsin. They have been pressed into the earth by the rocky thumbs of glaciers, ice pulled back, leaving its meltings behind, leaving kettles and moraines and riots of rocks. In Wisconsin, there are 59 lakes named Long Lake sometimes two in a county. There are 82 named bass, which might or might not be jumping with them, and 116 named mud. In Wisconsin, we boast that we have more lakes than Minnesota, which mentions 10,000. It all depends on how you define a lake. Wisconsin defines a lake as something more than a finger's width deep, like the lake in your bird bath, the lake in your dog's water dish, or the deep, wet pools in your eyes. 
So it's true, we have a very broad definition of what a lake is in Wisconsin. In Minnesota, it's more uh, based on square footage and depth. But, and there are more lakes in Wisconsin that don't have names. So another thing you could do around the dinner table at Christmas is come up with you know, new lake names, because some of them have been taken. <laughs> many times, many times. All right, I'm gonna read one poem about my father and then I'll finish up with one. Um, my father played in a polka band in the lacrosse area for about 35 years. And so this is basically a true story, I will tell you that. It's called Lip. When my father turned his tuned, his sousaphone, he fiddled with tubes and oil like when he restored the Model T, his hands working the pipes and joints. And all around him, it's polka, polka, big oompa pas, little dancing girls on the tips of the keys while he worked his embouchure into the proper purse of lips. Somewhere, bar lights glinted off the big bell, the name Bob engraved inside the swale, hill and valley, little dance hall at the end of a corn maze, small towns in Wisconsin, a fireman's dance and a cavernous hall, a wedding gig or two. He said nothing while he adjusted the weight on knees already bruised and aching. When cancer took a wedge out of his lip, he had to give them up. The beer barrel, the she's too fat, the blue eyes crying in the rain polka, the Lichtensteiner, a shotish or two. The music lived in his head, the tip of his tongue, the records stacked and dusty on the floor. So it was just as simple as that. Get down to see the surgeon. Hour later, he had you know inch wedge taken out of his lip, and he couldn't you know make that you know blow that horn anymore. So, and I'll finish up with this one, and then we'll see if you have any questions. This is called Sportsman's Bar, another Wisconsin thing. <laughs> I need to write one called Supper Club. <laughs> okay, Sportsman's Bar. There's one in nearly every small town or along some two lane with owners named Smitty or Oli or Hank. The bars have the same motif, lighted beer signs in the windows. They're always open. A few pickup trucks in the parking lot, if you could call it a lot, and around back a dumpster, pallets, barrels and empties, boxes and spent cases. Inside a jukebox, scruffy pool table, Maybe a few dusty mounts on the wall, a jackalope, a sorry looking walleye. There'll be racks of chips, Slim Jims and lottery tickets along the back bar, which is the best thing in this place. Majestic, polished with years of smoke and solace, oaken with a mirror so you can watch yourself tip a past pabst or slug a shot of brandy. This bar is no bistro or diner. If you want something more than those pickled pig's feet or those boiled eggs floating like eyeballs in brine, you'll want to move along to the place at the other end of town, the spot where no one knows your name. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions?
may be very you may very well be right about that. I won't be around in 50 years to know, but. Um, Thank you. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know that the classic poems are old fashioned, but they're not what the fashion now. There's, you know, and by all means, and I'm probably more um, remiss than you know, many of you in this room, as I have not taken a, time, a lot of time to go back and really study those old poems. I know they're there, they're the foundation from what's going, you know, what's being happening now. So they're valuable and they're worth, you know, they're worth it. So thank you for that. I'm pretty certain that the most well-read, or the poet most well-read right now is Rumi. And that's a poet of the 1500s. Yes. And that is a poet who in his language did not rhyme. So that tendency to rhyme is a fairly new effort. I also would like to point out that where poetry really shines today is in music. Mm -hmm. That's where we get the, the rhyming that we're missing maybe in traditional poetry. Yeah, in some music. I can't say all of it. <laughs> this guy, right, the, the cameraman. I'm actually going to follow up on what she said. Um, I was going to disagree with you about there not being any rich poets. <laughs> there are those poets called songwriters. Oh, yeah. But not all songwriters, or not many songwriters are rich either. Well, you know, there's some rich people that write poems called lyrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard Maya Angelou at the teacher's convention once. She got a lot of money for showing up there. But there are very few rich poets. So, yes, sir. I didn't want to be a lonely poet, so I decided early on that I would collaborate with visual artists. And I've used the uh, internet as a mechanism for getting my collaborations uh, out and seen and read by way more people than I would if I were trying to sell books on the corner. Yep. Uh, and the joy of that, of course, is in the interaction yes. between yes. Definitely. Creative people, you know, more often than not, I will take their artwork and I will look at it until I find the words. Alternatively, I will send poems to my artist friends and say, what do you think? And some of them have been turned into music. Wow, uh, and wonderful. my Poem Du Jour uh, website has been up on, uh, on the internet since 1997 when I moved here. Wow. Well, you know, that's that collaboration of various arts together, which reaches out and touches more people than one art maybe could do by itself. And then you're also creating a conversation across those different arts, which is wonderful. Wonderful. Do you have something to share? Yes. I didn't quite hear the end of that. Her seventh grade English teacher said, when you read a poem, listen for the music. Yes, yes, yeah. And hear the words that aren't there. Yes, that's very important because what's, um, the white space on a page in a poem is sometimes as important as the actual lines on a poem. And poets spend a lot of time 
working with that, where to end lines, whether you have two stanzas or three stanzas, and they spend a lot of time with that. So you end up with what's there is, is important, but what's not there is also important. And sometimes that's where you become the reader, you know, where you become part of the poem, because you often sometimes complete it. Um, a lot of poetry that I read sounds very personal, and I'm wondering if you feel that most poets write for themselves or they write for an audience and other people. Um, you know, I don't know about you know what other poets do, but when people ask me, you know, I had a young a gentleman email me a couple of months ago and ask. If I could tell him whether his poems were any good, I sent him the, um, uh, was it Rilke? Uh, letters to a young poet. But I also said, you know, first, if you're well read, you can see how your poems hold up against what else is out there. And the first person you need to please when you're writing is yourself. And if you've written well enough, your poems will reach out. But you have to please yourself first. If you like what you've done, then so be it. Can you be better? Maybe. Can you write something different or challenge yourself? Of course. But you're your worst critic, so you have to be pleasing yourself first. And you know the accolades. You know everybody has an opinion. So um, you know someone may like your poetry and someone may not, and they're entitled to their opinion, and you're entitled to the poem that you wrote. If you wrote it as well as you could. You really spent time and crafted it. If it's crafted well, it will reach out, I think. So that's a good question. Uh, who, decides, who decides today who is a great poet? I mean, I, when I think back in history, uh, a lot of people weren't recognized until after they died. Yeah. And um, you look at the bookshelves and what's read popularly today by various authors. Okay, uh, people <coughs> buying the books or whatever makes somebody famous or popular. How about with poetry? I, I can't say that I'm aware of anyone nowadays that stands out to me. Well, I think probably Billy Collins is probably considered one of the most popular poets today, based probably on book sales. Will he be remembered in 50 years? I'm not sure about that. We have um, some fine poets in our midst who are writing right now, and we've got some fine poets who have, have recently died. I can think of C.K. Williams, for example, um, Galway Canal. Um, I'm going to forget you know, half a dozen people. But these were people who were fabulous when, and they're in their time and who continue to be read. You have to go and look and see what's in anthologies, first of all, to see how those poets are carried f forward. You know, we have the Norton Anthology, um, but there are other anthologies that are being published and who is in them. So, you know, I think popular poet is kind of an oxymoron, like wealthy poet. But there are some poets who are making money from poetry. Billy Collins would be one of them. Maya Angelou what, at one time was before she passed away. But I think he probably gets you know, 70 or 80 grand an appearance. But he is also very popular. You look at his Amazon ratings when he ha comes out with a new book. They're very high for poets. So anyway. Or we don't recognize them basically as, po as poets, like Bob Dylan. Yes. Uh, people don't, they have other labels. Yes, I thought that Bob, I think of Bob Dylan's music as poetry. Yes. I may be yes. you know, on my own there. but. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've read some of the lyrics, if you read the lyrics, not just the ones that are um, in the songs, but they're often more lyrics than are you know, recorded. And they're just like stunning, just stunning. Make the hair stand up on the backs of your arms. So, yeah. Well, other than the Wisconsin Poet Laureate, since the program began, can you name other Wisconsin poets that that you read that you think are living? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Wisconsin has a ton of really, really fine poets. 
Ron Wallace, who is retired from UW Madison, Jesse Lee Kerchival, who is now on sabbatical in Uruguay, um, uh, Max Garland from UW Eau Claire, um, BJ um, uh, Best from Carroll University, Marilyn Taylor, who used to teach at um, UW Milwaukee, Susan Fuhrer, who also taught at UW Milwaukee. I can name tons of them, and if I forget somebody, I'll feel really bad about it. There, are, I, I come from the Fox Valley area, and there are just oodles of poets there, and they're very good. They're very good. You wonder sometimes where they come from. You know, and I remember I was talking to you earlier, talking about um, <laughs> Helen Farbach and Kay Sanders and um, Kay Saunders and um, uh, Ellen Court, how welcoming they were to me when I stepped into that fray and their kindness to me and reassuring me that I know really did not sound like an idiot <laughs> and keep working. But, you know, I always tell people, you know, how do you get involved? And I said, first of all, you have to write and read voraciously. You can't talk about writing or dream about writing or think about writing. You have to sit your butt in a chair and write. And you have to be willing to make mistakes and write badly before you can write well. But you also have to join in the community. You know, go to readings, support <laughs> other writers. It's not all about you. I've gone to readings where people will show up just for the open mic and then leave. <laughs> it's like, you know, we just brought a poet in from two hours away, and you're not going to listen to this person. But, you know, there are some people who are so wrapped up in what they write that they are not interested in anyone else. So good literary citizenship. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you remember how old you were when you told Linda <laughs> that you were going to be the poet laureate of Wisconsin? Oh, I don't know, Linda. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't start writing poetry until 1996, so I didn't start writing poetry until I was in my late 40s. I could never have imagined doing it when I was a younger person. And maybe that's right. Maybe the poet in me was not ready to come out. I didn't know I had a poet in me, and until then. So that's when poetry you know, came to me and it arrived without a face and touched me. I don't know. <laughs>